There's a war of words between former Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein and former FBI Director James Comey. Mr. Rosenstein officially stepped down last week. He vowed to stay on until the Mueller report was released, and he did. Tonight, he's speaking out at an event in Baltimore talking about the investigation and former Director Comey. So I do not blame the former director for being angry. I would be, too, if I were in his shoes. But now the former director seems to be acting as a partisan pundit, selling books and earning speaking fees while speculating about the strength of my character and the fate of my immortal soul. I kid you not. That is disappointing. Speculating about souls is not a job for police and prosecutors. And back with me, James Baker, the former FBI uh, general counsel. Y you were there, you started 2014. Correct. Right? So, I mean, you were there during the Clinton email. Uh, all the horrible stuff. All the horrible stuff. Can you just cumulatively, what has that been like there? It was traumatic. I mean, it was personally traumatic, I think, for a lot of us, and I don't use that word lightly. Traumatic in what sense? Well, you, like dealing, like the horrible situation having to deal with investigating presidential candidates under that microscope and that spotlight, I guess you would say. It was, it was horrible. We were put in, in the place of having to make, put in the position of having to make decisions in these types of cases that we didn't want to have anything to do with if we could possibly avoid it. We were sick a Anything of involved with a presidential candidate you know is going to be fraught with all sorts of potential damage. Fraught with peril, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so the idea that we were like looking around after, the, after going through the, uh, the Clinton um, email case or thought, thinking that we had finished it in July of 2016, uh, I'm sorry, June of 26. No, it was July. It, thinking that we had finished it and then wanted to like dive back into investigating another president, presidential candidate, uh, candidate is crazy. We just had no desire to do that. So for those who look at, you know, the FBI and they see a deep state attempt to overthrow the president, to undermine Donald Trump as a candidate, you say what? False. It's just false. It's just that's not what we were trying to do. We were trying to execute our responsibilities under the Constitution and laws of the United States, adhere to the Attorney General guidelines that govern what the FBI can do with respect to investigations, and proceed forward to try to protect the country from a very real threat from Russia. At the, at the end of the day, the whole thing was about Russia. That's what people need to think about. We were focused on Russia, what they were up to, what, how they were doing what they were doing, and to the extent that any Americans from the president's campaign or anybody else or anywhere else sort of came across our radar screen, we would deal with that too. But we were not trying to go out and find them. And, and we certainly weren't trying to collect political dirt or political you know, intelligence on any campaign. You know, there's been all sorts of reporting that, I mean, first of all, you just need to listen to the president on his thoughts about Russia. Uh, but there's been all sorts of reporting that Secretary Kirsten Nielsen wanted to talk about future Russian interference in the months before she left office and was forced to resign. Mick Mulvaney, according to the New York Times, I believe it was, said, look, don't bring that up around the president. He doesn't want to hear about it. It gets the, to the legitimacy of his election, in his opinion. Can the FBI do all it needs to do on, to try to combat Russian interference if the president of the United States is not commanding on this issue from the top setting the agenda, having cabinet-level meetings about this? Well, the FBI can do everything that it can do, but it can't work as well with the other agencies uh, if the president doesn't insist that the whole of government be focused on this threat and, be, and, and through his power and influence within the executive branch drive interagency behavior to make sure that this is a priority for everyone. He's got this obligation under the Constitution to protect the country. That's, that's his obligation and from all foreign threats. And this is a real foreign threat. I don't know how you can th uh, understand the facts in the Mueller indictments and, uh, and think otherwise. Um, I, we just got a word for, uh, that uh, Comey was asked just now about the comments that Rod Rosenstein made. Uh, and Comey's response was, I wish him the best to, uh, to Rod Rosenstein. Um, just one other thing. You, you read, uh, you, uh, I, I want to read something from an op-ed you said, uh, which addresses the president's statements about the FBI. You said, I fear the short and long-term damage such statements and actions will have on those institutions to which I've dedicated most of my professional life. I fear the consequences for the rule of law itself in the United States. One of the things Rod Rosenstein said in, in a speech right before he left was thanking the president especially, or praising the president for abiding by the rule of law, which is ironic given that the president tried to get Rosenstein particularly to lie about his involvement in Comey, 
talk, tell me just about what is the real threat to the rule of law in this country? Well, there are many aspects to it. I think one of the most important things is that it undermines the confidence of the American people in the institutions of justice within the country, the investigative institutions like the FBI, the prosecutors, and, and the courts. They need the confidence of the American people to be successful. People have to serve on juries, and the FBI wants people to help. We need the support of the public. We need people to give us tips, to uh, give us leads, to help us when we when need When you help. knock on a door and we say, need the FBI, you want somebody to have confidence that what that, they're they're, that we're there for a legitimate purpose and that you can trust us and we're going to follow the law. That's what we need. And uh, yeah, and then these conversations, statements about wanting to prosecute this person or that person coming from the President of the United States and sometimes for political reasons, lock her up and these kind of things. I, I think that's just detrimental to the fair administration of justice in the United States. And again, the President has the obligation under the Constitution to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And that's important, and he needs to do that. And this kind of language this kind of intemperate language is just not helpful to that end. Is the FBI sending a, a female investigator undercover to meet with Papadopoulos, is that spying? Because that's, not only is that what the president says, but now that's language being used by the attorney general, the head of the Department of Justice. So first of all, I'm not going to comment on particular things that the FBI did or didn't do. Uh, and the inspector general is looking at everything that we did. And if, uh, you know, the IG usually finds mistakes that we made, and so I expect him to find mistakes this time. But I can say that, you know, at least from the intent of the people that I was dealing with, there was no intention to do anything uh, wrong or illegal and not to spy on a campaign, and this, at least as I understand that, meaning uh, intending to collect information in some fashion that is about the politics, about the political decisions, political intelligence. There was no effort to do that that I'm aware of. I didn't see anybody talking about anything like that. For you, the focus was Russia. Focus was Russia. Foreign intelligence information, evidence of a crime related to Russian activities, and any Americans that were uh, in, in connection with them. And you would not have used the word spying? I would not have used the word spying. We, we, I, the FBI acted lawfully. Uh, spying, to me, connotes something that's unlawful, improper in some fashion. Mm -hmm. James Baker, really appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure. Thanks. Uh, we're going to get some more perspective now. Joining me is Elliot Williams, a former Deputy Assistant Attorney General, also CNN Chief Legal Analyst Jeffrey Tubin, as well as CNN Chief Political Analyst Gloria Borger. Uh, Jeff, I mean, is it any surprise that Rod Rosenstein would push back at Comey, given what Comey said? No, it's, it, it's not, and, and you, you can see why both of them take the positions that they do. I mean, just remember the, the history here. I, mean, I think we take it for granted that everybody remembers, but, you know, the president wanted to fire James Comey for one reason and one reason only, because of the Russia investigation. And then he sends Rod Rosenstein off to invent a pretext to fire him. In the Mueller report, they use that word, a pretext, of that he was fired because he was too mean to Hillary Clinton during the, uh, during the 2016 campaign. Just a preposterous justification. He then, the president then asks Rosenstein to uh, elaborate on that, to, to pretend that that's the real reason that Comey was fired. And that, to me, is, I mean, it's indefensible that what Rod Rosenstein did. And you can understand why Comey is upset that Rosenstein allowed himself to be used that way and then praised the president on the way out the door. So uh, the, the contention between the two is very much understandable. Gloria, what's your understanding of how the FBI views Rosenstein at this point? Well, my understanding is that they view him with suspicion, that they call him the survivor, uh, I've been told, inside uh, the FBI. Obviously, there's a large group that likes Comey very much and, and feels that he was uh, unjustly treated. And while they give him some credit for shielding Mueller, uh, to a degree and shielding the Mueller investigation from the president and anybody else who wanted to to get rid of it they also believe that he has broken down the lines of independence between the Department of Justice and and the executive branch and they think also that he has not done enough to defend the Department of Justice to the executive branch when the president uh, starts criticizing it. Elliot, I mean, it's not like Rosenstein wasn't deeply involved in this whole saga. It was his letter, as, Je as Jeff points out, that was used to fire Comey. Right. You know, he was probably talking about wearing a wire in the White House, invoking the 25th Amendment. And then he just sort of seemed to fall in line behind Attorney General Barr. 
And this was exactly the point that Jim Comey was making when he, I mean, he used some personal language uh, using the soul stuff. But what we saw back from Rod was, I'll teach you a new uh, legal term, which was the sick prosecutor burn, which is basically, you know, as sort of, that's as pointed as a career federal prosecutor will ever get. But where I think Comey has a point is, you know, let's not forget that in November, just five or six months ago, the president tweeted out an image of Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general of the United States, behind bars. The president, you know, tweeted, you know, fired the secretary of state not long before that when he was on the toilet with a stomach virus. And on and on and on, there's a sort of consistent degrading of both public service and the people that serve at the highest levels of government. The Washington, Aaron Blake in the Washington Post today had a piece laying out the 17 senior government officials that the president first called the best people and then attacked. And so under those circumstances, it's incredibly hard to serve. And we have to ask the question, what does it take to survive? Well, we know, and that's unflinching loyalty to the President of the United States.